The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Advocate comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who issues from the Father, he will be my witnesses. And you too will be my witnesses, because you have been with me from the outset. I still have many things to say to you, but they would be too much for you now. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will lead you to the complete truth since he will not be speaking as from himself, but will say only what he has learned, and he will tell you of the things to come. He will glorify me, since all he tells you will be taken from what is mine. Everything the Father has is mine. That is why I said, all he tells you will be taken from what is mine. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to your Lord Jesus Christ. Very good morning to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. And blessed Pentecost to all of us here. So finally, we have arrived at Pentecost after a long period of Easter celebrating the resurrection of Christ. Actually, from the time of Lent, we have been preparing, preparing for this day. So finally, it is here. Just now when we sang the entrance hymn, uh, what was it? Come, Holy Spirit, let your fire fall. I was thinking, what, what, what emergency? We're going to call the fire brigade later. <laughs> so my dear brothers and sisters, do you feel empowered by the Holy Spirit? Do you feel like there's a fire burning in you now? After going through the whole spiritual journey of starting with Ash Wednesday, you know, and then you go through the whole period of mortification, penance, prayer, charity, alms giving. Finally, to celebrate Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter. Then after that, rejoicing in the resurrection of Christ. Listening again to the preaching of the gospel as the apostles did. Right? They were telling us what this good news was. And finally, the ascension of our Lord to heaven. And today the coming of the Holy Spirit. So by today, actually, each one of us here should have those tongues of fire upon our heads. I don't see any, don't worry. I don't think you can see one on me also. <laughs> Though I'm wearing red today to remind us of fire, right? Okay, anyway, you know, in our KL Archdiocese, we have one priest, a capuchin priest, beloved priest of ours. He's full of zeal and energy. He preaches very energetically. And he always says, fire! We all do not, if you know who this priest is, you will hear this word. Whenever we see him, we, will say, we won't greet him, hello, Father, we'll say, fire! Because <laughs> he's all on fire for God. Huh? He's a capuchin priest. Anyway, go and find out who it is. <laughs> it's a long time he hasn't come to our church. We should invite him one day to come and preach here. Okay. But you know, as I was thinking of fire, you know, there is another symbol also of the Holy Spirit. And it's the exact opposite of fire. You use it to put out fire. Water, right? And so during this whole Easter season also, we've had baptisms. Yes, or not? Yeah? Being reborn in water, through water. Of course, it's the Holy Spirit acting yeah? through the water, through the sacrament of baptism. We are being cleansed, sanctified, born again as a new creation transformed by the Spirit. So today, also we can think of water. Yeah? And in some ways, I prefer the symbol of water. And I feel sometimes water is even a more powerful symbol than fire. And why? Because you see, even you look at the, the mountains, huh? the water that has been flowing and flowing, it can cut out even large canyons. Over thousands or millions of years, the water is flowing. The action of water is so gentle. 
and yet it can be so transformative. Yeah? Fire, sometimes it feels like it's just pop, a spark like that, it's just a burst and then finish, fizzles out. Water is more persistent and more gentle. And so actually, I prefer water as a symbol of what we have been called to do. A very long-lasting, gentle effect that we Christians are called to be in this world. Yeah? And that's why when we think of water, so you think of peacefulness, serenity, tranquility. And that's what our presence in this world is supposed to be. A peaceful presence. We are all called to be instruments of God's peace. We are called to be instruments of God's love. Right? Where there is woundedness, we bring healing. And this is where I think water is an even more beautiful symbol than fire. Okay, fire also has its advantages, but we'll talk about that some other year. How we can be also like the fire that burns. Yeah. Okay, today I'm not going to talk about the first reading because we are so familiar with it. Pentecost, right? that scene of Pentecost, we know it, we have heard it so many times. What I would like to speak about today more is in the second reading, which comes in year B. They are in year B of our liturgical cycle. So this year, we have read this particular reading from Galatians. And it's a beautiful reading about life in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so it's hard to remember what we read because we just read it at one go. And in fact, I would encourage you when you go home, go and look at this reading, Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25. And it is in this reading that we have the so-called fruits of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember what are the fruits of the Holy Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay, I don't have it off the top of my head, so I am looking at the book to read you the list. These days, we are not very good in remembering things. Okay? So, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, gentleness, self-control. Okay? So, these fruits of the Spirit, this is what we hope and wish we have in our life. And we have these fruits when we are walking by the Spirit. Now, walking by the Spirit means that we are being guided by the Holy Spirit. It means that we are belonging to Christ. And because we belong to Christ, the Holy Spirit is empowering us, filling us with the grace that we need to live a life of holiness. And this is what the church is trying to get us to do the whole year around to live a life of holiness, which is none other than living life under the direction of the Holy Spirit. So now, when I ask you, are you all on fire with the Holy Spirit? Actually, I'm asking you, do you feel that in your life, you are living under the guidance of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, so that is what it means also to be on fire with the Holy Spirit. And when you're on fire with the Holy Spirit, you will see those fruits of the Holy Spirit. You will see in your life bountiful, plentiful fruits of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, trustfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You know, they say to remember things, you've got to repeat many times, okay? So three times I've repeated the list. Don't worry, I still can't remember the list. More or less, like, it's there. Now, whatever word stuck to your mind, most likely that's what you yourself are yearning for. That's why it's sticking to your mind now. If you try to recall one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit, you're probably longing for that. And if we live our life according to the teachings of Jesus, if we live our life following His command to love one another as He has loved us, if we live our life according to the teachings of the church, if we live our life in a spirit of prayer, devotedness, where every day we put aside some time to be with God, that's what it is to pray. Putting aside some time and really being there at that moment, wherever you are, to be with God. 
and pray in however, whichever manner you know, whether it's the rosary, whether it's just reading the Bible, whether it's just being silent, whatever it is, maybe it's singing a hymn, singing some songs, maybe it's listening to your phone, praying the Divine Mercy Chaplet, whatever it is, that time with God, and most importantly, coming to church also and participating in the Eucharist. Okay, so this is all part of living life in the Spirit. And when we do that, we will truly be on fire for God. Okay? So that's the second point I wanted to bring to our attention. Now, the Gospel tells us that everything the Holy Spirit will teach us, the truth that the Holy Spirit will lead us to, the Holy Spirit will take that from Jesus. Okay? And I'm going to give you an example of that. You know what we read in the second reading by St. Paul? Those are not St. Paul's words only, you know. It's the Holy Spirit guiding St. Paul to teach us. So that itself is a teaching, a teaching of the truth that is coming from the Holy Spirit, actually, through the Apostle Paul. Now, I want to show you how this teaching that we read today in second reading, it is actually coming also from Jesus. Second reading we read about if you are guided by Spirit, the Holy Spirit, huh? you will be in no danger of yielding to self-indulgence. Now, I want you to remember that word now. Self-indulgence. Okay? Self-indulgence, St. Paul tells us, is the opposite of the Spirit. And then the whole thing goes on. You know? What are the fruits of this self-indulgence? All kinds of things, lah. fornication, gross indecency, sexual irresponsibility, idolatry, sorcery, feuds, wrangling, jealousy, bad temper, quarrels, disagreements, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, etc., etc. <laughs> wow, the list is so long. These are all the fruits of self-indulgence. And St. Paul tells us the very opposite is living a spirit-filled life. Yeah? If we are living a spirit-filled life, guided by the Holy Spirit, because we are belonging to Christ, then he says we will crucify all self-indulgent passions and desires. So hear the word self-indulgence. Hear the word crucify all self-indulgent passions and desires. Now, can you think of something that Jesus taught us that can lead us to this teaching? Self-indulgence, then crucify. Yeah, crucify. This self-indulgent passions and desires. Okay, never mind. Maybe some of us didn't have our coffee this morning yet. I'm sure you know it. I'm sure you know it. And remember Jesus taught us, if you want to be my disciple, what must you do? Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. I'm sure all of you know this. Though we are not Protestants, we don't bring the Bible, we don't try to memorize all the scripture verses, every Catholic will know this. You want to be my follower, Jesus says? Deny yourself. Correct or not? Father bluffing you all or not? You want to open some Bible and check? Jesus really said this? Yes, right? Deny yourself. Pick up your cross and come follow me. Now the Holy Spirit through the mouth of Paul saying actually the same thing. Deny this self-indulgence. So now we have a greater idea. What is this self that Jesus was talking about? What is this deny yourself? Deny the self-indulgence, actually. So Spirit is giving more clarity now to us. The teaching is becoming clearer. Can you see the work of the Holy Spirit here? So if we just look at the words of Jesus, we might even misunderstand what is this self that Jesus is talking about. So in St. Paul, through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit through St. Paul tells us this self is actually regarding a spirit of self-indulgence. And Jesus says, pick up your cross. And what does St. Paul say? Crucify. You pick up the cross to be crucified. 
So can you tell me, is St. Paul teaching, or rather is the Holy Spirit teaching through St. Paul a new teaching, or is it the teaching that Christ already taught us? Surely, the teaching that Christ taught us. That is why Jesus said, Holy Spirit will lead you to the fullness of the truth, but what he is teaching you, he will take from what I have already taught. So you see the clarification, the deepening of our understanding that comes through the explanation, the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So this is where the Holy Spirit plays a very important role. After Jesus went up to heaven, yes, he's still with us in the Eucharist, in the Word of God, in amongst the people. He's here with us. And we know it only because we are living under the guidance, the influence of the Holy Spirit. You know, even for the bread and the wine to transform into the body and blood of Christ, it is by the action of the Holy Spirit, not by any other way. There's one part, you know, the servers will ring the bell suddenly when they see Father put the hands over the bread and the wine, and it says to pour forth the Holy Spirit so that it may become the body and blood of Christ. That is the important moment, starting. And then it concludes with the words of Christ. Yeah? That whole process. But if there is no Holy Spirit, nothing happens. So you see the importance of the Holy Spirit, not only in leading us into the truth, but in giving life to the church. Everything that we are, the whole sacramental life that we have, that we enjoy this presence of God is only through the Holy Spirit. Okay, now if anyone comes and tells you that Catholics don't believe in Holy Spirit, they don't live life according to the Spirit, don't be deceived by them. There's nothing in Catholic Church if there is no Holy Spirit. Are we clear? It doesn't mean you have to be jumping up and down, pants on fire, and shouting hallelujah all the time, speaking in tongues. Oh, then your church full of Holy Spirit. No. There is baptism in our church. There is Holy Eucharist in our church. There is sacrament of marriage in our church. There is ordination in our church. There is all these things which are work of Holy Spirit. Works of the Holy Spirit. Not just charismatic movement. Eh? Even that is one manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Even the person sitting quietly in front of Blessed Sacrament and doing contemplative prayer. He is also a charismatic it's just that he may be a bit shy. He's not happy about jumping and clapping his hands and shouting hallelujah everywhere. Because why? We are so many personalities and we all pray according to how we are. We have different personalities. Some are extroverted, some are introverted, some are oh, whatever it is you want to call. The way of prayer is so many. And Holy Spirit works accordingly to how we are. Okay, do we see this? So don't ever think Catholic Church no Holy Spirit. We are not a charismatic church, therefore no Holy Spirit. This is wrong. Wrong idea to associate charismatic way of praying with Holy Spirit. In fact, our sacramental life is all about Holy Spirit. No Spirit, that is nothing. It's just emptiness. No Holy Spirit, the bread, the wine we are receiving is just bread and wine. Do you understand? Clear enough on this point? Yes? No? Too long? Cannot? I was falling asleep? No. Okay. All on fire, on fire, on fire. You shouldn't be sleeping. <laughs> okay. I'm also getting choked on my own spit. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Swallowed. Okay. <sighs> All right. Now, last point. La, coming back to explain about this idea of self. Another wrong idea that people have. People think Christian, la, being a Catholic or a Christian, they are great haters of the human being. They are great haters of pleasure, great haters of progress, great haters of everything. They only love the poor. They only love being miserable. <laughs> that also is a great lie. Don't believe that. Yeah? The self that we are being asked to deny is that particular self-indulgence which often comes from selfishness, from lack of concern for others, from greed, from covetousness, from all these evil things, you know. And it leads us really to deform the human being who we are. It doesn't add to our dignity. 
It doesn't build up ourselves actually, it destroys us. The church is not asking us to destroy the beautiful human being that you are. You know, today we talk a lot about self-improvement. The church is not saying don't improve yourself. When she says deny yourself, she's not saying destroy yourself. It's okay. It's not important because we are just a spiritual being. It's not. The church never says that. Now, a lot of us in the world now, we are attracted to this self-improvement. There's nothing wrong with improving yourself. But do we know that our self is more than our worldly self? There is also a spiritual self. And that spiritual self cannot grow if we are indulging in the sinful things of the world. Now, not everything in the world is sinful. No, there's a lot of good things. And nothing prohibits us from enjoying that. So when Christ says, deny yourself, don't misunderstand. He is not saying hate everything that is human. No. He wants you to improve yourself. He wants you to build yourself up. But under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, when you are a slave of your passions and your desires, and you are not able to control yourself, when just say every night you are only in your room, turning on internet and looking at pornography for three, four hours, and then couldn't sleep also at night, and then next day you can't do well in your work, and then after that you are quarreling with your family. Do you think that freedom that you have to go at home and indulge yourself in looking at these things, is it in any way improving yourself? It's not. Even those people who are serious in the world, huh? they are not Christians even, about self-improvement. Think of the fitness influencers. They will tell you, make sure you get your eight hours of sleep, go to bed early so that you can be fresh. They'll tell you, go and exercise. They'll tell you even, avoid all of these things that make you lose your sexual energy. Even the worldly people know these things are harming us as human beings. So it's not that we are just against these things because, oh, they give us pleasure. Because, oh, pleasure is a sin. Nobody said that. You know how pleasurable it is to live life according to the Spirit? When you are under the influence of the Spirit, truly you will know what this word pleasure means. A lot of what we are so-called enjoying in the world that is at the same time destroying us, these things make us slaves. And it is good that Jesus tells us, deny yourself. So that why? We can be freed from these slaveries. Not because he is against us being happy. So remember, the gospel is a gospel of self-improvement. But the real self is not one that is indulging in the pleasures of the world, but one who is alive in the fruits of the Spirit. Now, if you live that life, then you will know you are really building yourself up. And you are maximizing your potential as a beautiful creature of God that has been born on this earth. God does not love misery, my dear brothers and sisters. God does not love suffering. He does not love sickness. He does not love all of these things. When He created us, He created us for all that is good, all that is true, all that is beautiful, and all that is healthful. All these other things that have come in the world, they are the fruits of the spirit of self-indulgence. And that is why Jesus tells us, stay away from that. Free yourself from that. And then you will return to the original plan of God, of what a human being should be. A dignified human being. We all exist, but have we the existence of a dignified human being. And what is this dignified human being? A child of God. And what is this child of God? Someone who lives according to the Spirit. And in whose life you will see love. I want you all to repeat this after me. Say the word. Love. Joy. Joy. Peace. Peace. Patience. Patience. Kindness. Kindness. Goodness. 
trustfulness, gentleness, self-control. And that's the last word I leave you all with today, my dear brothers and sisters. The exact opposite of self-indulgence, self-control. And self-control doesn't mean that we are slaves. It means that we will be truly free. No longer prisoners and slaves to our worldly passions.